tips. Thank you, Tim. Uh, this is a sweet one here, Cedric. John Rolf running Transmogrify in, in the control deck uh, to get Dream Trawler onto the battlefield. Also, a pair of Ugin the Spirit Dragon for the top end, but he is going to be under significant pressure from Simon, who's running this throwback deck at this point. The cycling deck is four color, but it's really red white uh, in essence. And it hits you hard and early and then provides this completely alternate late game around Zenith Flare. It's really tough deck to, to handle. Yeah, and I think that's going to be the hardest card here for Rolf to be able to beat in this matchup. You know, Simon is kicking it old school with flourishing foxes and cycling cards, uh, something that we really haven't seen people do uh, in a meaningful way since these bannings have taken place of Omnath and Lucky Clover and Escape to the Wild. So a fire prophecy is definitely a good way to slow Simon down, but it's this Marshall long-term inevitability of Zenith Flare that I'm really scared about for Rolf. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because we're going to actually probably get a chance to see the three different angles that Simon's going to attack from. This was one of them. Flourishing Fox is the best thing to do on turn one in the entire deck. You only get to run four of them, but uh, but Simon would love to see more of those cards in his openers at any time. So that is your tall approach. That's go tall. You can also go wide here with Valiant Rescuer. And this is the other angle that Simon can attack from where he can now start producing a bunch of one ones and Rescuer is gonna become a board state in and of itself that's gonna demand an answer from Rolf at some point. Then we'll transition into the late game where as aforementioned, uh, Zenith Flare shows up and hits from a totally different angle that has nothing to do with creatures, nothing to do with board state. Instead, it's going upstairs and doing potentially lethal off of one spell, depending on how things go. Yeah, and I think Tim brought up a great point when we were analyzing the decks there, insofar as Rose does a lot of the work for you in milling your deck to put more Cyclops in the graveyard to make Zenith Flare lethal ahead of schedule. We've seen players go towards escape cards uh, to take advantage of the fact that Rogues is milling you, but we haven't really seen anyone go towards Zenith Flare. Simon, the only person trying that approach, he's 2-1 and one so far through weekend play. Uh, on the other side of things, though, here, don't know if you noticed that record there for John Rolfe. It's been a bumpy ride to start. Rolfe was fortunate to have the answer there early so that he didn't just simply get ran over by that flourishing fox, but now facing down the rescuer is going to have to continually come up with answers here against Simon. Yep. Simon's going to continuously put him to the test. And actually we're going to see a second value. Wow. I'm not sure. Not sure. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm slightly surprised, but what this also does, Marshall, is it basically says you better have shadow to the sky or this game's going to be over quick. Yeah. Th this is a, a very aggressive play here from Simon Gertz. And, you know, there's a world where you want to hold off, on the second rescuer as it can build its own board state again and you can just simply reload you saw a little head nod there from simon is he had it because as you said the big benefit to the play of running out the second rescuer is if your opponent doesn't happen to have that sweeper you're going to win uh, you know in two terms the game's going to be over yep. as it stands now we may see Luris come in as something that matters um and, and we'll have to see how this goes from here yeah, Simon's in some trouble. He hasn't really been able to get this game started off. Fl Flourishing Fox died. Valiant Rescuers have died. Uh, and now there's a Zenith Flare. So, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Now, Simon doesn't know John's hand like we do. So we see the hand of Trawler, Transmorgify, Shatter the Sky, which against a, a, a Zenith Flare is really kind of a nothing hand. It looks like Simon's going to go ahead and play his land and pass the turn. Now, it may not look like he's doing much, but... You know, Simon continuing to cycle through his library is building up future Zenith flares turn after turn, and he'll continue to do so as we see him get rid of even more cards. Oh, there's another Flourishing Fox and even a Memory Leak in hand now for Simon Gertzen as well. Yeah, if the plan is Zenith Flare, if it's just, hey, I'm going to deal 14 with this card, then we're cycling it all. Let's yep. just get rid of everything, right? That's right. So the real question to me is, would he like to slightly weaken Zenith Flare for a Flourishing Fox? And it does seem like the upside's there as he goes for it, because now he can grow this and say, here, you need to you need to deal with this now too, and I'm going to continue to cycle cards like Memory Leak here. And he, I, it does look to me, Cedric, like he's going to try to get this Zenith Flare up to lethal on its own before firing it off. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 and I like that. Like, given his draw, given that he's some of the creatures that have been killed were cycling creatures, flourishing flocks, uh, and the Valiant Rescuers should be able to do it kind of all by itself. Now, 
Transmorgify can go get a Dream Trawler, obviously, uh, and but that Dream Trawler can't attack right away, mm-hmm. and so I'm not sure. It looks like this Zenith Flare. Okay, the Zenith Flare is at ten, ten, so it's not lethal yet. Right, and he's got startling development and a pair of shredded sails in hand as well. Uh, so it would stand to reason that Dream Trawler may get an attack in. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting too is the flourishing fox, right? If you if you put a Dream Trawler on the battlefield and Simon goes attack, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, no. what are you doing? Are you chump blocking? Are you you know makes your life very difficult? But we're going to see it here. There's Transmogrify, and it's going to grab. Well, the only target in the deck, which is Dream Trawler, there's there's a bunch of them in the library or in the library though. I think he's actually running all four. Yeah, four Dream ETs for John Wolf. So he says, "Well, this is the best thing my deck can do right now. Go and a Valiant and Rescuer I, off the top for Simon." I would be surprised if Simon isn't just like, "All right, I'm attacking you," and then yes. you you decide what's going to happen after that. Right, and if John doesn't block, it could leave him dead right like we could see a cycle and then a land drop would end the game yep so let's see what john wants to do he's gonna block well this is this is win-win here for simon in my estimation because you're gonna get the dream trawl off the battlefield you can grow your fox to outlive the trawler and your zenith flare plan is still in place so he's not really losing anything I mean, so much pressure coming from Simon's end of the battlefield that if he goes cycle, cycle, kill your dream trawler here, he can pass the turn and still have John kind of in check, right? Yep. Where he says, tap a bunch of mana to get rid of this thing or you're going to lose. Yeah, this is All a right. great spot to be. This is a great spot to be in if you're Simon. Yeah. Beautiful. He even hit the land here as well uh, that could be relevant for next turn. In the meantime, it's a chump block. Now, that does put John Rolf up to 17, but this is another problem. Again, Simon's hitting from so many different angles that now a fire prophecy isn't good enough. It's going to take a shatter the sky to get this flourishing fox off the yard, and that's going to make the Zenith Flare nearly lethal. Remember, the fox going to the yard pumps it up by yet another, and they're still cycling to happen right now on end step here for Gertson. Now, I can't quite see the number on the Zenith Flare anymore, but it's got to be very close to lethal at this point. Yeah, I mean, we got to be pretty darn close, right? And and this was mm-hmm. this was the card that I was most scared of for Rolf, just right, right off the jump. And now, the nice thing here about the Stinger coming down is, like, he's got cards to cycle. He can play more threats if he wants to and go a little wider, which he's doing now. So now it's cycle, you know, ping you, make a 1-1. One, one. You know, you've already cast two shatters. Don't think you have a third shatter. If your turn is cast, is land dream trawler, you're a hundred percent dead. Boy, this matchup looks really good for Simon. At least in yeah. game number one, we see Narset of the Ancient Way off the top, and I think if if Simon saw that, he would just laugh. It's just like that is not where you want to be here. <laughs> As Simon is sitting here holding, it, so it looks like it's at fifteen. So that is lethal uh, next turn. For Simon and John just has no good route here. He's going to cast Narset. Sure, that's the that's the old big who who cares for Simon Gertson, right? Sure. In fact, you're probably just helping. Yeah, right. Because now you can have that. Right, Rolf's going to Rolf's going to discard a card here, kill one of the creatures. But if he doesn't kill the token, then it's just going to add another. In fact, a lethal cycler to the graveyard. Yep. And with only one mana available, there's really nothing that that John can do, and and Simon can just simply fire off his uh, his Zenith Flare on his own turn. So yeah, the way looks... is clear now for Simon. Yeah, this is easy breezy. Yep. And I'm not going to say this is how every game's going to go, but you know, if, if you're on Rolf's side, it's kind of like I don't know. I killed your first couple of things, right? I, I fire prophesied your, your fox before it got out of control. And then I, you know, I shattered away your two Valiant Rescuers, and I didn't even really get, get close. Yeah, that was not remotely close. That yeah. was the Zenith Flare for 17. 
<laughs> just one card, 17 you, and he's got three more of them in the library if he needed to dig. That is absurd and quite an easy walk there for Simon Gertzen as he gets game number one in the books. Coming into the round, Simon was two and one, and as you can see, John perhaps not set up well uh, against the metagame as the tournament ended up being. Uh, who knows? But he's he's coming in at 0-3, so a rough, rough start here for John. Yeah, his uh, his weekend thus far has gotten off to a very difficult start, and this is, uh, let's just call this not the ideal pairing to get that first win. Uh, mm. So might be sliding into 0-4 territory, might be able to pick up a couple of wins to close the day out, but I do not like his chances here. He is just not well-equipped, even in his sideboard, to handle this matchup. Right. Super rough here for John Rolfe coming in and and seeing your opponent go turn one flourishing fox and it's like oh god yeah yeah that's a that's the appropriate reaction oh god indeed right because I mean you know these players know who and what they're facing each round but like that doesn't mean that they always have the exact <laughs> draws that you, you know you don't want them to have but here especially by the end of that game, it approaches inevitability on some level, just in the sense that they've seen so many cards that the idea that they don't have a Zenith flare in hand starts to become pretty, uh, you know, non-believable at some point. And, you know, looking back at that turn, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of, like the third turn of that game, fourth turn of that game, perhaps for, uh, for Gertzen, where he played out the two copies of Valiant Rescuer. And it's like, okay, well, we see that Rolf has two Shadow of the Skies in his hand. So it's like, well, I don't know why you're doing that. That looks a little bit strange. It's important to remember that, first of all, open deck list, as you mentioned, Marshall, uh, Rolf has two shatters. Mm. That's it. So the plan of going close. wide. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the plan of going wide makes a lot of sense. It's like, OK, you're on a two outer to stop me from going wide. Right. Uh, there's a third shadow of this guy after sideboard. But for game one, I think that play just from a mathematical perspective of you're on a two outer. Otherwise, this game's going to end. It makes a lot of sense. Now, did Simon get punished in the short term? Yes. But did he win in the long term, as we saw? Yes. So totally fine. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we saw there's two copies of Ugin the Spirit Dragon main for John Rolfe. And, you know, that that's the type of card that if you need to tap out for that, Simon's like, I got you. Right. Yeah. Like he he's going to 17 you or something the turn after you cast that. All right. Looks like we can head into our second game here and see maybe if John can put together a little something better. Again, a rough one here for John. He's now he's on a mulligan to six. And his hand is Jewari Disruption, Fire Prophecy, and Lands. So the Yikes. tough thing, the tough thing here that you're seeing on Gertzen's side is this cycling deck. When it looks good, it looks really good. But the downside is, is you play a lot of air. <laughs> He's got multiple spells he can't ever cast. Uh -huh. <laughs> And it's not a deck that mulligans particularly well either. You're really just a you're, you're a critical mass deck where all the pieces work really well together. And when you keep a card of seven hands, you start with a fox. You're cycling that up, blah blah blah. You'll find your land drops because you're cycling, uh, and then you're casting your zenith flares on turn four, five, or six. It all looks really good when you mulligan to five, like I think Simon has done here. It looks significantly worse. It really does. Uh, they don't have a way to get ahead on cards, right? Yep. That's not the name of the game here. It's they they can tread water sort of indefinitely since every card in their deck has cycling effectively, but yeah, they're not, they don't have a way to, to reload with a bunch of cards and then, and then to take advantage. Oh my goodness. John Wolf just cannot buy a bucket today. Said he's just, <laughs> he mulligans against the six keeps fire prophecy, Jewari disruption, and then draws dream trawler. Uh, the iron unkind right now for Rolf, I would say. Yeah, very rough. And from Simon's perspective, he just wants to find as many lands as he can. And, Good for him. He did. So he gets to play a Valiant Rescuer here, which will probably eat Jawari Disruption. A little bit punished there from Simon. He had a choice to play Flourishing Fox, but decided against it. Yeah. Curious what his plans are with that Fox this game. And that's a kind of, that might, be, that might sound like a weird thing to say, but uh, we do know that Rolf's deck does have a lot of creature elimination. Uh, and if you, you know, so if you want to play Valiant Rescuer and go wide for a turn, Okay, sure, that makes some sense. But Fox going tall and making one big threat, I mean, we're looking at a deck that's got Shadow of the Sky, Fire Prophecy before the party can get started, stuff like that. I wouldn't be surprised if Simon just says, I'm going to cycle that. This I don't think it's going to get it done this game. Interesting choice again. Now he's facing down the same decision as last time. He's got the Fox and the Rescuer. Will he go a different direction? Let's find out. Interestingly, doesn't look, let's see, 
Yeah, so that that middle card is a mountain there for John, right? Yes. It's kind of a weird one, but yes, yes it, it looks like a mountain. So that means that Fire Prophecy is available. And so Simon's actually just going to go ahead and cycle first to see if he can hit his other land, which he did. Which makes me think he's not going to do anything this turn. Yeah, I don't know. Because you would like to have that fox time before you start cycling, though it looks like he is going to play it now. All right, so this is interesting. Is Simon playing this as just like, hey, I think you have a fire prophecy, so this is the bait spell because my bigger plans are Valiant Rescuer? Yeah. I mean, it's it's obvious. I mean, this is a Pro Tour champion we're talking about here. So that very well could be in his calculations. Very possible. And a nice one there. So the deck starting to get a little kinder here to John Rolfe as he finds Scorching Dragonfire a good clean answer for the Rescuer. Now, as far as answers go, it's about as clean as you can get. When the game goes a little longer, though, they can cast a Rescuer and then still have the ability to cycle a few times to at least get a creature on the battlefield. And it looks like John's going to let this happen. I'm a little surprised to not see the response to the cycle. Same. You hit a land off that, you can cycle again and get another 1-1, one, one, and those can get mm. really annoying. Yeah. Not but sure John if that's an oversight. To let it go. Yeah. Yeah. Not sure. Not sure if that's an oversight. If that's a little bit of frustration on Rolf's end, uh, so on and so forth. But you know, not not punished all that much. No. It, in fact, not at all. Just the same one one that uh, Simon would have gotten anyway. <clears throat> it's going to come in, knock John down to uh, nineteen for first blood there, and a little bit of an awkward hand now for John. That dream trawler he drew so many turns ago. He needs to find another uh, white source or another land at all here to be able to to cast the dream trawler and then the transmogrify does not currently have a target on john's side now technically you could use it on the on the token but that's not good <laughs> are you sure <laughs> that is not good <laughs> oh hey uh and chat's pointing out that the rescuer only can trigger once per turn you have to do it on your opponent's turn and oh, your sure, turn sure, sure. so that's why it didn't matter yep that's on us yeah Oh, they told us, too, that that's on us. In fact, oh, yeah, they weren't even nice about it either. You know, chat, you hurt our feelings today. We're not used to being wrong, right? So that's the, the hard part. Chat comes in hard. Let's do a little scrying. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, nice. John's mana base is just going to fight him now. Cool. <laughs> chat said don't test us <laughs> oh yeah yeah they did <laughs> like, what, you i'm want trying to decide if we should just chat? push back hard or maybe just bow down here well, I, <laughs> there's I, a I lot of one them one. and only two of us said marshall i play one way aggressive so if chat <laughs> wants it come and get it <laughs> all right uh, it looks like cory has got our back he's threatening to time out the entire chat so. there it is there <laughs> thank you Corey. Chad is never wrong has been announced. Well, yeah. Never is an interesting word to use there anyway. It's extreme. <laughs> but uh, in the meantime, this uh, this one one is going to keep on chipping in there. And uh, this is really going to be kind of dream trawler or bust here for John, it looks like. Though he chose not to cast it. He's just scrying. I suppose he's not under any immediate pressure, so he can have some time to wait. Oh, well, there's a flare. Oh, he doesn't have the second white source, does he? No, yeah, that's the problem. So, like, when I mentioned that his mana base was, was kind of pushing back at him, so his scry with Castle Vantress, um, basically, like, it would it would have been a it would have been a Jeskai Triumph, and that would have been an issue. Like, ETB's tap, so, you know, his Dream Trawler is basically on suspend at that point. So, you know, just... Not only has he had difficulty kind of out of the gate, but he has... You know, he, I'd say he slowed Simon down. Now he's having difficulty casting, casting his Dream Trawler. And he's got nothing to transmorgify. So, let's see if we can find a white source. Well, we sort of did. Boy, John's deck is just not cooperating with him today. No, the struggle, the struggle is real here, too, because we're looking at Birth of Miletus Negate. Negate is very attractive because of the card Zenith Flare. So there's a very. reason that, you, that you'd want to keep that, right? But 
when you play Birth of Miletus, you search for shuffle. planes and shuffle your deck. Yeah. So awkward. Yeah, so you're like in this weird rock and a hard place now. Also, what's strange about that is I don't want to I don't want to say he got auto tappered there, but he kind of did because now he can't scry with Castle Vantress. Because he has four he plus Vantress, but did. it used the blue. So Good God, Cedric, this, it's just like nothing is going right for poor John. So oh, awkward. Goodness sakes. That's all right. I'll just peel out of it. It's fine. I mean, he, you know, if this dream trawler survives, we've seen what dream trawler can do, but Cedric, excuse me, Simon is holding a Zenith flare for 13 as it stands. Dude, <laughs> sweet draw step. <laughs> he may just use it. No, he's going to just go for the, for the big kid here. All right. Well, this is it. Dream trawler or bust here for John Rolfe. If he can start turning this thing sideways, he could turn this game around, put himself out of range of Zenith Flare potentially, and uh, and draw a bunch of extra cards to to secure the the victory here. But as it stands, precarious to say the least. Uh, I'm inclined to agree. All right. Well, got access to the entire grave right now because Luris is on the battlefield. So Luris plus Stinger plus Cycle the Wolf Tinya. All right. Close. 13 versus 16, but no mana left here for Simon. And that means that uh, old Dreamy T looks like it's going to get in there. Well, it looks like Dreamy T is going to get a hit in, and the hit's going to be for... Well, this actually, this is kind of interesting. So we're in a really kind of unique game where... Okay, John's going to gain two from Birth of up to 17. Trigger yeah. Dream Trawler twice, so going to go up to... I think it's going to be 22... When all is said and done. Okay. Now, Zenith player right now is for 14. But Good Stinger's... Tough to get all the way up. And you, there's going to be another Dream Trawler on the battlefield as well. Yeah, I think that second Dream Trawler might be the thing that causes the big issue here. Boy, if John can, like, actually pull out a victory here... <laughs> be pretty impressive. I would be impressed because it's looked pretty bad for him most of this game. And he's got enough cards in hand that he's happy to discard to keep Dream Trawler around. Gertzen, this entire game, has not been able to find a blue for the mystical dispute that's in his hand. That's been awkward, but that's the cost of playing four colors sometimes. He's looking through his graveyard now with Luris online. He can cast one of these cards. All right, double ting you. But boy, when two Dream Trawlers get to attack in tandem, it gets ugly very quickly. There's a blue yeah. mark, by the way. Probably a bit too late at this point. John, I think, deciding if he wants to cast Birth first, but he's going to go ahead and just bash. And now a bevy of triggers go on the stack once again. Bang, bang. Oh, that's just a little 12-er. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah, that's the exact season, as we say in the business. And somehow, some way, John Wolf manages to pick up game number two after an awkward mulligan, awkward draw steps, awkward all around. Well, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't the prettiest game of magic I've ever seen. It wasn't pretty. It, it was ugly. Chat missed a bunch of stuff about what was going on. We, we didn't were miss anything. Accurate as always. Yeah, we didn't miss anything. Which is, I mean, we, we're the only thing keeping it pretty here. Right. We. we <laughs> yeah, I just asked Kibler, right? Like, yes. He hasn't <laughs> seen your your change of. What time. change? We've never cut to me. No one knows that I changed clothes, Mark. That's what I'm Nobody saying. He hasn't that. seen it yet. <laughs> He doesn't know that he pressured you. He 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 socially pressured you into putting on real clothes today. <laughs> he bullied me. He 
he bullied me. Friend of almost 20 years just bullied me into putting on a collared shirt. Yeah, he really did. It was great. I got to see you slowly crack under the pressure, like live in our chat. It was just like, I don't have to do this, do I? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I should. And then it was like long Fine. pause. Fine. <laughs> and then you were off my screen. Fine. <laughs> By the way, players are hitting out the sideboard here. And uh, we got to see what John's game plan was post board, basically just taking out the stuff that was uh, ineffective against Simon's deck. You see Elspeth conquers that, that type of thing. But, uh, you know, plan A was Dream Trawler and it worked. Those are a problem for Simon. He really does need to kind of have his game plan in place and put himself in a position where John has to decide between tapping out for Dream Trawler, but risking just losing to a Zenith Flare. Or continuing to keep up mana for counterspells of various sorts or interaction of various sorts while Simon accrues value and improves his hand. That's kind of the dynamic that Simon is responsible for to apply to John. And he wasn't quite able to that game. So John was able to hit with a couple of dreamy tees, and that was it. And that took care of it for sure. Uh, let's see how this one looks. Eh. I think you keep. I don't think you're in love, but I think you keep if you're Gertzen. And this actually looks like a real hand here for John. So, hey, might have a good third game here. All right, let's get it underway. There's Draw Your Disruption off the top of the library. It's going to be a triumph to kick things off, though, for John. Kicks the turn back over to Simon. Played his own triumph to kick things off. And he's got a Dran a Stinger, so not the most explosive start for Simon Gertson, but it'll do. And we're going to see Birth of Miletus now. For John, he's going to go find a planes out of his library for passing the turn back. That guarantees that the Dranstinger is going to get in for at least two here. Yeah. It's not the worst start I've seen here from Simon. You know, it's not a fox start. That's the ideal start, especially when you're on a play. But you got a stinger, a healer that you're probably going to cycle, uh, and you get some pings in here. So you just got to kind of figure out and this is actually the difficult this, the difficult part when playing the cycling deck is just what do you want to cycle and when do you want to cycle it? Looks like Dranith Healer will get cycled here. That's one tingling there from the uh, Dranith Stinger. Boy, that's a, a lot of air in hand here for Simon. A couple of lands. In fact, three lands left over and startling development. So he's going to want to kind of work his way through those. But the cards could become anything, Marshall. They could. And they just did. There, there is you go. Zenith Flare. Hello, friend. It's already up to three in for two with the Stinger after the additional three damage that turn. So down to 15 goes Rolf. Just off of Dran Stinger. Not bad. Yeah, but if you take a look at Kurtzen's hand outside of that Ragman Triumph. That's this is rough. Yeah. Doesn't really have a great. Okay. Okay. Now we have a polarized hand, Cedric. <laughs> We've got two Zenith flares and lands. It, it's the two things you want more than anything else and the things you want less than everything else. So yeah. Uh, wide range here. I'll say for Simon Gertzen, an easy block here for Wolf going to jump in front of the stinger and Simon just doesn't have anything to do here. No, and so here's the here's the issue here for Simon too that he may be aware of or may not, but we we have access to hands, so I can say this with uh, complete confidence that if you're if you fire off the Zenith Flare at the wall to kill it, and it's like okay, that's my way. I'm going to stop him from transmorgifying. Okay, well, I'll cycle Shark type and make a one one land transmorgify, get Dream Troll, you're dead. Right. right. So he's just holding steady with his Zenith Flares right now, and I think what Simon's trying to do is represent Mystical Dispute, saying I mm. have it. You do not want to cash transmorgify. You don't want to do anything. And I'm going to try to buy time this way. Yeah, John, you know, was really hoping that Simon would have tapped some more mana here and made it easy. He could just go land, transmogrify either of these creatures, turn it into a dream trawler and say go. At 17 life with only three cycling cards in the yard, he's perfectly safe to do so. And he'd have a full hand to protect the dream tra trawler from any interaction. So as long as it hit the battlefield, he'd be good to go. Yep. Now things are a little different here with Simon passing the turn, perhaps bluffing 
The mystical dispute, as you said, he does have Zenith Flare as well. Let's see what John does. I have it. I have the dispute, John. Don't cast Transmogrify. I have the dispute. I promise I have it. That's what Simon's saying right now. Yeah. And look, it's going to work here. Shatter Skull Smashing is going to get cast for two just to kill the Dran Stinger. This was not the highest impact line that John could take, but definitely the safest. And we're going to see a cycle triome here now from Gerton while the Dranid Stinger is still on the battlefield. So every point of damage counting here. And look at that. He cycled into Boon of the Wishgiver. And look at this. Mm -hmm. Simon actually has two blue sources. And he's like, hmm. <laughs> you know how I mentioned before that they don't have that way to draw a bunch of cards? They technically do with Boon. It just doesn't get cast very often. But uh, yeah, he did think about it, but ultimately decided to cycle it away. It's incredibly rare, but yes. it was worth it was worth thinking about briefly. So now Simon Ooh. has Simon has these two flares that are dealing six, right? You mm -hmm. cycle you cycle memory flare, and now the flares are dealing sevens. By my math, seven times two is fourteen. We're a mm -hmm. little short. So close. Here's memory leak also, and it's an interesting question on well, he's gonna go ahead and cycle it. So there we go. And with a land drop for the turn, oh, hello, Valiant Rescuer, Valiant Rescuer now as well, providing perhaps another angle of attack, or is it time for Simon to just cycle everything forever? Yeah, he's just going to pass the turn back. Yep. So if you're going to, if you're Simon, and you're going to say, hey, I've missed able to sweep my hand and represent that last turn, I think it behooves you to represent that again this turn. Now, if if Rolf says I'm. Rolf says, I'm going to go for it, right? So here's what, if he just says, I'm going to go for it, he transmogrify, loses. he loses the game. Yes. Exactly. Wow. Well, this is cool for Simon. The ability to, to conceive of, you know, to like convincingly bluff a counter here out of this red-white primarily cycling deck has really opened up the door because if John feels the pressure is too much and he just needs to go for it, it's over. And, and John does have Dwari Disruption in hand. Don't forget that, that if Simon, you know, wanted, because there's also a world where, you know, if John doesn't tap out here, Simon could say, all right, well, I'm just going to go for it. Flare, untap cycle, and then flare for the win. But that would not work here. Yeah, and I and I don't expect to see Simon go for that, and he's no not way. going to. He's just going to cycle some stuff and just say, you know what, I can play a longer game. I'm at 18. You're not doing anything of consequence. And I'll move if you make me. But in the meantime, I'm going to keep cycling and build up how much these flares can deal. This game has been awesome. Yeah, I'm sure also Simon has to consider more than just Dwari Disruption. Uh, you know, there's a negate in the sideboard, for example, uh, of John Rolfe. Well, if one disruption is good, two is better. They don't ever play around the second one, do they? <laughs> no. I don't. I don't. That's right. <laughs> it is kind of interesting, too, because if that Birth of Miletus goes off, third chapter, gain two life, that might mess things up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't think a ton, but, you know, it's it's a non-zero thing to keep in mind. A little bit awkward that Simon has drawn his copy of uh, Fight as One, the type of card that you want to see to protect one of your creatures on the battlefield. Uh, he's got two of those in the sideboard, and he's drawn one here, but he doesn't have anything to do with it. It's just rotting away in his hand. Currently, Fight is None. <laughs> I'll be here all weekend. If they... oh, I like that. That was good. Yeah. If they let me, I'll be here all weekend. Uh if I get to vote, you're here, buddy. That, yeah. That is none. This is a tough spot because if I'm John, you know, I'm trying to navigate this nonsense. And I'm probably thinking to myself, okay, look, he's definitely got one flare. So right. I'm just going to, I'm going to play like Simon has one. Now it's, it's, it's entirely possible that Simon's just flooding. But I'm going to play like he has one. Am I going to play like he has two? Can I afford to play like he has two? I don't know. But you know what? We got our first real action. That's right. So Dream Trawler on the battlefield. 
finally, for John Rolfe. He's been very patient with this. And now the pressure is starting to mount on Simon Gertzen, where he may feel the need to just fire off a Zenith flare. And if there's a negate, then there's a negate, but he's not getting around that anyway at this point. Yep, and I totally agree with you. If there's a negate, there's a negate. It's not like Simon has a ton of missile disputes or anything like that, and he definitely doesn't have one in his hand. So yeah, I'm with you, and he's just saying, look, if you got negate, Ooh. okay. The first and that one. should be game then, right? I mean, John would have to counter the first thing he could counter here, right? Like, well, if I John think, had negate, he can't be like, sure, you got it? Well, I think if I'm John, I would be fine letting the first thing that resolve, and I'd counter the second one, if okay. there is a second one. Um, and if not, you're just like, play on. Okay. Yeah, I, I think. I, I'm sure there's arguments to countering the first one with the negate, but for now, it's just kind of like, I'm curious if Simon just, I'm curious if Simon's thought process now is, all right, the first way resolve, I guess I'll just go for the second one and see if it's good because I am facing down a dream trawler. Right. I, he he may feel, and he may be right if he does feel that way, that he doesn't have a choice, right? That if he starts taking hits from dream trawler, that the Zenith flare will not be enough to win the game anyway. So it's use it or lose it time for the flare. Now, John is hoping, hoping. You can see him shaking his head. He's like, please, please, no, 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 don't go for it. Don't do it. I don't do yep. And there's the Zenith flare from Simon. The only thing that John can do is a little chump check here just to make him pay the one mana. But uh, Simon's going to pass that test and bang, eight damage upstairs is going to give the round to Simon Gertzen, he did have the two and a big sense of relief there from Simon at the end of the game. Wow, that was an exciting one. So much tension between both players trying to interact their primary game plans there, said. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, right? Because when we're watching here from the booth and everybody's watching at home, it's just kind of easy to just go like, well, just cast your two Zenith flares. The game is over. But there's a lot to consider in that situation there if you're Gertzen, because if that second Zenith flare gets negated, it's game over. But Simon could also just say, hey, I'm not going to cast a second Zenith flare. I don't mind getting hit by the Dream Trawler and the Birth of Elitus gaining two life because I could just go cycle, 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 build my dream, build my Zenith Flare up and then fire off, right? Like that's a consideration there too if he's playing around exactly in the gate. Ultimately, Simon came to the decision of either I don't think he has it or if he does have it, things are bad enough for me that I just shouldn't wait. Or he might also be saying, I don't want to give him more draw steps to get to it. So I'm going to let it rip. If it's good, I win. If it's not, I probably lose. It was good. We know who our winner is. That's right. Simon Gertzen, only one loss on the day thus far. He did knock John Wolf to 0-4, so really tough start there for John. Perhaps yeah. not the metagame choice, or perhaps not uh, his day. You know, you never really know. Sometimes you make the right choice and it doesn't work out. Okay, well, let's take uh, – uh, oh, actually, let's hear from Tim to figure out what we're going to be seeing after the next break right now. Thank you. Yes, Marshall, we do have some more magic for you. A nice little game we got coming up for you now, actually, between Yoshihiko Ikawa and Mathieu Avignon. We're going to get a chance to see Gruul Adventures against one of the various singleton decks in the field. But one of the cool things about the league is that it's round robin. Everyone's bringing their own decks. Everyone can see everyone else's decks, and we can see all the lists, as can you, on magic.gg. Mathieu Avignon, he has brought Mono Green Aggro. It's a list that potentially we saw good work from uh, in previous iterations of Standard. We're going to get a chance to find out just how well it plays after these messages. Hello and welcome to The Bolt, your rapid-fire introduction to the most exciting players in Magic. And right now I am joined by Matthias Leverato. How are you doing today? Good. Very good. Thank you. How about you? Oh, pretty good, thanks. So let's get straight into some questions. Do you have a favorite magic deck ever? Mm, yeah, of course. Uh, Seeming Nexus, the one that I used to to win Mythic Championship 3. For sure, it's like one of my two favorite decks ever. And also Black Green Alps from the Norwegian set. Yeah, It's like the first deck that I ever played competitively and I, I really enjoyed it. What's the best color of mana? Uh, if I have to pick one, I would choose green, but I also love a lot blue, so that's my favorite combination. Do you have a favorite format? Um, I kind of like standard, but any constructed format works for me. Maybe not the eternal ones, because I haven't played them a lot, but constructed, standard, modern, historic now. What's a card you really don't like seeing your opponent play? 
Oh, I hate playing against mono red because I tend to pick decks that are not that good against mono red. So I kind of feel bad every time I lose against mono red. Uh, who would be your biggest rival in the MPL or Rivals League? Who's the player you want to beat? Uh, I never have the chance to play against Kai Bude, so I'm really looking forward to it, and I, I think it would be pretty sweet if I can take him down. Uh, some non-magic questions. Uh, yes or no? Pineapple on pizza? Yes, 100%. Good choice. <laughs> <laughs> Do you prefer the city or the countryside? Uh, city. What's your comfort food? Uh, I don't know if you're going to know it, but here in Argentina, we have something called milanesa, which is like a breaded meat, uh, and it's pretty decent. Awesome. And one more question. Where can we find you online? Uh, I have a Twitter account, Lebunga21, and a Twitch, uh, Lebunga. Uh, I've been streaming lately, so you can find me there. Hello and welcome back, my friends, to this, the first league weekend, Zendikar Rising League weekend. On this Saturday, we're getting a chance to bring you all of the play from the rival side of things. Tomorrow, we will have a bunch of MPL play. But before this round closes out, we have another match for you. It's kind of a nice one. We have Yoshihiko Akawa of Japan. He is up against Mathieu Avignon of France. And here we've got, well... Bizarrely, in spite of the fact that it is the third most played deck in this Rivals League uh, on this league weekend, Gruel Adventures, just the three people playing it, Ikawa being one of them, and we're going to get a chance to see his list here. Uh, this is the deck that gets to use Embercleave and potentially get a whole lot of damage, especially with the help of Landfall. We saw Adventures being great in the last previous iteration of Standard. Will it still be? Cedric, what are your thoughts? Well, 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 Gruel Adventures, put on the map by many people, but most notably Autumn Burchett and Emma Handy in the 2020 season grand finals. Tim, as you mentioned, the main reason to play this as opposed to a monocolored aggro deck is because of Embercleave. I say monocolor, I say mono green, of course, which I know we'll get to in just a second. How good do I think this is? Well, I'll tell you, I know it's powerful because we just saw those two excellent players do great with it a couple of weekends ago. I don't know how great it is in this metagame right now. I do have some concerns, but I always lean towards with aggressive decks. You can beat anything because that's what an aggressive deck can do. Great Henge is powerful. Ember Cleave is incredibly busted. Uh, there's a lot to like about this. If you want to be attacking, I do think it's the best way to be attacking, Tim. Well, that doesn't sound like too good a sign for Mathieu on the other side of things. Mathieu Avignon playing mono green aggro here, so no access to Ember Cleave, but he has got a few little tricks up his sleeve he's been able to pick up just by being mono colored. What do we think about this one, Cedric? Well, this is the deck that I primarily stream on Twitch, and I've tried a lot of iterations of this deck, so I can understand the inclusion of Garrick Unleashed, the inclusion of a singleton copy of Vivian, the main deck copies of Questing Beast. The way that this version of mono green aggro is built is the idea here is to really, really pressure the Yorian decks as fast as possible. Uh, and so by doing that, you do make some sacrifices in other places. And this might actually be one of those spots where you're making a sacrifice against the Adventures deck. If you knew that Girl Adventures was going to be a heavy player in the metagame, you probably wouldn't have Gem Razor. You probably would have four copies of Primal Might. So I don't love the matchup here. For Avignon, it's not impossible to win because, again, you're an aggressive deck and you can beat anything, but his deck would look different if he thought that there was going to be a lot of real adventures in the metagame. Of course, these players do have access to deck lists, as do we all. If you go to magic.gg, you can find out 
all of the lists uh, and see exactly how things are going there. But we're going to get a chance to see exactly how this matchup plays out as we go back down to our virtual feature match area with Marshall Sutcliffe and Cedric Phillips. Thank you, Tim, and uh, welcome back here. So two players at two and one actually uh, coincidentally matched up. Yoshihiko Okawa on the top side of your screen, Matthew Avignon on the bottom. So you, you were saying, said that this version of Mono Green, which, yikes, uh, that opener, um, <laughs> is is a little more on the full full court press side of things rather than the, uh, you know, sort of, targeting certain other decks or whatever. This one's kind of all in. Is that is that what you were saying? Yeah, I would say that this one's trying to be a little bit faster and try to kill the opponent uh, as quickly okay. as possible. I mean, not playing three cops to the Great Henge, um, you know, not trying to play kind of the mid-rangey game that the Mono Green deck, deck can play because, you know, the longer you go, you're just going to end up losing to urine and all the nonsense that it does, You right? So you're trying to be a little bit quicker with cards like Garrick, less fight spells. Like a lot of mono green decks originally were playing four primals because that card's fantastic. But in this exact metagame, it behooves you to actually play four ram throughs, of course, and less removal and just more ways to end the game quickly. Okay. So a little bit of a mull here, it looks like, or three, four, five. No, maybe not. But there's a... Uh, Swarm Shambler here to kick things off. What is that? Is that the? Is that how you want to go? Oh, that, oh, that's Swarmy Shambles. Absolutely. Okay. Make a little tutu. If they if they get their Bone Crusher on, you get a couple Knuckleheads. Just I, I like I like myself a Swarm Shambler. Okay, and we got a pair of them here. Yep. There's a Love Struck Beast that's going to prompt an activation here from Avignon, who now has a tutu, but it is going to have a hard time keeping pace with the five five on the other side. Though we do see two copies of Primal Might in hand now for Avignon. Now, what's the game plan from here? Is it to to just start leveling up your Shamblers indefinitely? Do you, do you actually run out your Love Struck Beast? What happens? Well, the play here it looks like it's going to be Primal Might probably for zero on the 1-1. One, one. Hope my opponent doesn't have another 1-1 one, one to attack with their Love Struck Beast. Which, okay. Nice. You can do that. You can make a 1-1 one, one here off the Love Struck Beast, get your value there. And then you can pump one of your Shamblers Either one from a 2-2 two, two to a 3-3 three, three, or making one a 2-2 uh, two, two instead of a 1-1. One, one. I like just continuing to grow here up into a 3-3 three, three, and then ideally a 4-4 four, four, and a 5-5, five, five, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Is that partially because of Stomp or what's the what's the thinking there? Stomp is one reason. Second reason, too, is because having two 2-2s two, two while is, it's nice or whatever, if my opponent kills the Lovestruck Beast token from Heart's Desire, then I'll have two 2-2s two, two, and then my Lovestruck Beast can't attack when I play it. So now I'm a lot oh. to have. Now I'm a lot to have a one one no matter what. And now that that scorching dragonfire killed the sham the swarm shambler. Now I have plenty of one one. So that's why you'd rather have a three three and a one one as opposed to two two twos. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Love struck beast in the adventure zone here for Avignon. Looks like it's time to come off of adventure as just the most mana efficient play that he could make here. Back to Ikawa, who added scavenging news to the board last turn as well. Speaking yeah. of stomp. So Ooze is a fantastic card in these green aggro-ish mirrors. Um, of course, if you have if you have enough green mana, your creatures are going to trade and exchange, and then your Ooze is going to run away with the game. The reason that we didn't see Avignon really panic about that card is because, I mean, both players are 20 life right now, and he's got two removal spells, so he can control the Ooze in a pretty meaningful way. All right, well, next turn could be pretty explosive here for Avignon with the 5-5 on the battlefield. And you see Primal Might there as well to perhaps smash its way in. And we're going to have to see what Ikawa can come up with. Because remember, both of these players are trying to be assertive. This particular game has played out in a way that doesn't look like that. As you can see, both players are still at 20 life and we're on turn 5. But normally, you know, these decks are looking to bash and get the job done. Now, the damage output for these decks, though, is very high on any given turn, right? Yeah, it can be a lot, and it can be more for the Gruul Adventures deck simply because of Embercleave, because right. that card's so incredibly powerful. So we're in a little bit of a what I would consider to be a kind of a strange game, but I think right now things are leaning the mono green player's way, Avignon, because he can kind of clear the road a little bit here. You got a primal might, you gotta decide how much you're gonna do it for and what you're gonna target, which is always an interesting question. Uh one that I have been known to struggle with at times. Because mm. the versatility the versatility of this card is incredibly high. So like you can you can kill here and then do you wanna you know how much is X? Do you wanna 
do you want to attack with a love struck beast when it's going to have damage on it from the fight? So sometimes this is kind of a hard puzzle to solve. Yeah, it looks like Avignon may be trying to find out a way if he can combine Primal Might and Ram through to just get two key creatures off the board and still have an attack of some sort afterwards. It looks like the answer is no, no to not, you can't do all of those things, right? You, you will have some amount of damage on your creature and there will be something left over to block it, but he could still get two things off the battlefield. Yeah, I mean, if you want to make it as simple as simplistic as possible, you ram through for, or excuse me, you primal for zero, you ram through, um, the bone crusher giant. Mm -hmm. And then you just say my five, five and your five, five, do you want to trade? Right. And then if the answer is no, then it's a cool, I still have my five, five. And then if the answer is yes, you trade the five, five for the five, five, then you're just like, okay, well now my one ones are free up to attack. Right. Right. So you could, you could do that sort of thing if you want to. Now this attack looks, uh, Cleavy. weird. Yeah. I mean, but this is, this is the surest sign of an Ember Cleave ever, which is also a good reason to hold the Ram through to blow out the Ember Cleave. And is that what we're going to see here? Oh, yeah. yes, it is. Exactly what Avignon predicted. Boom. There goes the creature that was going to get equipped for free with Ember Cleave. And instead, nothing happens. And now, there's Yorvo off the top of the library. I want to send with everybody. Yeah, you always want to send with everybody. That's, but here's the sorry, thing. That's true. That's I'm true. with you this time. <laughs> I like the sending with everybody. If you want to trade one 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 for eight damage, be my guest. Yep. <laughs> and as it turns out, Ikawa does not have any interest in that whatsoever. Thank you very much. Yorvo hits the battlefield as a follow-up, and you can see Avin Young in good position here with eight power against zero on the other side. Enviable position, too, because draw steps for Avignon are basically all good. Um, I would say that I, almost every card that he draws is castable right now. And then I think the only one that's not is the Great Henge. And then if he draws a land, that means he'll be able to play Serpent for six through Castle Garenbrig. So he's in that enviable position of all basically all my draw steps are good. So that'll work just fine. There you go. So in, 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 down to 12. And then just go for the the five. Is it six? Five? What is it? It'll six, be six through Garen Brink. Castle. Mm -hmm. yep. So six, six, Serpent. Not quite lethal on the board, but pretty close. And really has Ikawa scrambling. And unfortunately for Ikawa, he seems to have uh, a little, the slower end of the deck here. Uh, you know, cards like Brushfire Elemental are really not good on blocks. Not where you want to be at all. The Giant will do its thing. But uh, as you can see... Not a great block here for the Serpent. Yeah, 6-6 six, six, Reigning Supreme on this battlefield. Don't forget about protection from multicolored as well. So right. obviously the, the Brush Fire Elemental is not ideal on defense. And now with a Gem right. Razor to go on to that Serpent with Mutate, we are probably all done here. So that's going to make it a 10-10 with Trample. And then there's also four 1-1s. One and that just looks like it's too much to handle. And as you mentioned, the Elemental can't even get in front. So kaboom. Matthew Avignon picking up game number one with mono green aggro. Who needs Embercleave? Well, Embercleave got destroyed there at the end of that game. So, and I and I like the way that Avignon played that game. I was I was suggesting maybe get a little bit more aggressive. It, he had the option to get more aggressive. I guess I would say on that turn where he had primal. Uh, primal might and ram through again. He could have just said primal your scavenging use ram through your bone crusher giant attack you. Do you want I, to I actually like that line better. Uh, he ended up having a similar line two turns later, but just yeah. without the damage from the one ones in between. Yeah, you know, it's like, do you want to trade the five five with my five five? And it's like, maybe yes, maybe no. If you do, again, that means my one ones are free to attack. If you don't, um, then I still five. have my five five. Yeah, you know, so right. something like that. He took a bit of a slower approach, got to blow out an Ember Cleave in combat a little bit with that ram through, eventually destroyed the Ember Cleave. And, you know, it's always a risk marshal when you use one of your removal spells to take care of the one, one that love struck beast has made because uh -huh. the adventure deck has edge innkeeper. It has brush fire elemental. It has uh, other copies of love struck beast to cast hearts desire. So sometimes it can look really bad for that game for Avignon and end up working out perfectly. All right. looks like we're just about set for game number two. Again, coming into the round, these players are both two and one here on league weekend. We're on uh, the rivals part of our tournament here today. It's all the rivals. They're playing round robin. 
as we go around. So their records won't always match up like they do here. In fact, they usually won't. Uh, but the players have to hang in there and fight it out against everybody else eventually. And then tomorrow, if you want to come join us for more, we're going to have the uh, MPL playing it out. So the big the big names uh, are going to kind of fill out the rest of the weekend here, and we're going to get a chance to see them duke it out against each other as well with some really sweet matchups. That they actually got posted by the uh, Magic Esports Twitter, if you follow that, and you can see some of the the sweeter matchups and some of them that we're going to actually get to watch tomorrow too. Yeah. Today is kind of the appetizer before the main course. And you know, this is a heck of an appetizer. This is yeah. a, what Marshall, what obviously we, well, we used to eat out a lot given our road travels. What was your go-to appetizer? Was there something that if you go to a restaurant, you're just like, I got to try it here. Uh, nachos. I love calamari, big fan, uh, taquitos. I, I will, I will put down a plate of taquitos anytime. If I had to pick one um, for coverage purposes, I would say nachos because they're shareable. Okay. Okay. And you're getting, and you know, I don't like you're getting shared on either way, right? Like if you get an appetizer that's not shareable, it people are going to, hey, can I have a little, hey, what, what do you got there? And yeah, they're going to get sniped anyway. So you may as well yeah. just concede early and uh, and get something that that everybody can eat. Yeah, someone just said in Twitch chat, Kai, Kai Bud's the appetizer. Uh, in this yeah. instance, yes. <laughs> yes, he is. Yes, he <laughs> That's is. what I mean. He's a really good appetizer. He's the crab cake. And I can't right. wait to indulge. Oh, crab. Oh, my God. Did you That's just my say go-to. crab cakes? That's my go-to. Oh, my God. Uh, but I'll warn, you, I'll warn you. Low floor, high ceiling. <laughs> it's totally true. <laughs> bad crab cake is so bad. It's so true. A mushy pile. Uh, and it, it can be awful. So good. Oh, that's great. Uh, by the way, LSV versus Kai is a court, apparently the surf and turf. I don't mind if I do. All right. <laughs> no, Corey, crab cake. Crab, crab cake. Corey had Corey. a crab cake. He, he subsides off of plain pizza and chicken nuggets like his co commentator. <laughs> <laughs> they did actually match us up based on what we like to eat, you know. By the way, a similar start here for Avignon um, with the two Swarm Shamblers, though one of them did get killed with the other one on the stack, so just one insect was created. In the meantime, Boom Sauce, here comes the big kid, because <laughs> Andy Hammett <laughs> as a 5-5. Five five. No trample, so this is perhaps a good opportunity to throw a chump block in and soak up a lot of damage. But no, no, Don't mind if I do. Going to keep this okay. Uh, adversary around to potentially draw cards or or d up against something a little bit better. You know, here's another one of those big fellows and, and swarm shambler. I know it looks funny. I was initially pretty anti swarm shambler when I first tried this deck, but it's surprisingly good. It does look suspect in here, but I uh, know, I know. You're right. Yeah, you know the combination of being another playable one one for your beasts and all that kind of stuff does seem to add up. Here comes primal might. And this is on an Oakham adversary as well, which will clear the way for it to get in. And that'll draw a card. I want to get in with both. Let's feel it. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Everybody we, we, go. We're not, we're not going to chump block with that 2-2. Two, two. But you don't get in there. No, don't even think about it. Yeah. There you go. Boom, boom. Seven damage comes through and a trigger from the Oakham adversary. Very productive turn there for Avignon. Really kind of putting the ball in Ikawa's court and saying, you got to deal with what I'm doing here. You see Shatter Skull smashing in hand here for Ikawa. Yeah, this looks like it's going to be a good turn for Ikawa because you're going to be able to fetch up the land, so trigger the Mammoth. Play Shatter Skull smashing uh, as its land. Take three to do it, sure. But now you trigger again, and now you've got Vivian on the battlefield. Now, I think... Well, I don't know. Maybe attacking for seven is good here. Maybe you want to slow down a little bit. I'm curious. Okay, so we're going to slow down. Oh, that was disappointing, though, wasn't it? You got two landfall triggers and a 7-7, seven, seven, and you're like, go, so I can have a 3-3 three, three on blocks. How miserable. Uh, it is miserable, but there's a lot of value, of course, in keeping that Vivian around for another turn or two. Uh, and if I am, if I'm Ikawa, I'm kind of feeling now that I've untapped, I've kind of turned the corner. Uh, and Bone Crusher Giant's on a bad draw step, and it looks like a Scavenging Ooze perhaps is now showing up too. So life is pretty good for that Gruel Adventures player. By the way, chat's getting completely out of hand with the crab cakes. They're now claiming that it's not worth it to have a crab cake 
on anywhere but a certain portion of the East Coast, as if we don't have good ones over here. Yeah, that's just not true. Yeah, that's just not Dungeness true. Crab, hello. Hello. Pleasure to meet you. In the six. Yeah. Look, I'm just saying, I go to, I mean, I go, done a lot of traveling over the past 10 years for this gig. Mm-hmm. I've, had crab, I've had crab cakes in St. Louis. Awful. I've had mm-hmm. crab cakes in uh, like Indianapolis. Totally fine. It's, it's high variance. Mm. High variance. You just don't know sometimes. But you, you, the only way you find out is by playing the game. You got to have bravery. You got to yeah. just dive in. By the way, somebody said, what's a crab cake? <laughs> well, we are on the internet, aren't we? We are indeed. I'm going to let them take care of that. I've never even heard of crab cakes has been called. I'm not touching that. Yeah. You'll get one one day. You hang in there. I hope it's a good one, too. I do, too. Cedric and I both hope you eventually find out what a crab cake is, order one, eat it, and then even enjoy it. Yes. No, Magic said hedron crab cakes. No, 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 no. No hedron crab cakes, no ruined crab crab cakes. Yeah, (laughs) no, you don't want that. By the way, uh, this Vivian is doing great work here. You know, that Oakham adversary did get to connect and draw an extra card for Avignon two turns ago, but now there's these elks that are starting to uh, populate the field here, and they're doing a really good job of keeping it at bay. Tim Willoughby asking behind the scenes, how do we feel? I mean, we're going completely off the rails now. How do we feel about the uh, San Francisco, I believe I believe he said crab cake bowls? Crab bread bowls? I don't, I don't crab know. Crab bread that. bowls. I, can't, I mean, I can't imagine those are bad. It's I'm just assuming seems- that he's just talking about clam chowder. I don't think so. Bowls? I mean, just crab just, crab, just crab bread bowls in San Francisco. There's no way that's bad. No. Yeah. No. Everything about that is good. So you can't combine them and come up with something bad. Yeah. I just can't imagine it's bad. The math dictates. Now, what is going to happen here? Turn timber symbiosis in hand for Avignon. Uh, is it castable just yet? Four, five, six, uh, maybe not quite. It looks. It looks like a land short. Well, here's what I, I'm going to. I'm going to shortcut this for you a little bit. Um, okay. The Great Henge might be showing up here in just a moment. Vivian's oh, been active. Vivian's been active for a couple of turns, and I'm not feeling great about this game for Avignon. This one really did seem to take a sharp turn when Vivian showed up. Uh, it brickwalled the next attack when Ikawa wisely left back the Kazandu Mammoth and then had the 3 3. Avignon was not able to break through those defenses. They didn't get smaller over the course of the next two turns. And now Ikawa is, in fact, attacking and starting to apply pressure for his on his own side of the battlefield here. So yeah, I'm with you said, this one looks like it's really slipped away from Avignon game two, maybe going to a Cabo in the next turn or two. And you can see just how important and productive and active Vivian can be. Now it's mm-hmm. a planeswalker. It's funny. I, I've been doing this thing. I, I, I was comparing Vivian to Nissa who shakes the world and Nissa who shakes the world was this planeswalker that ETB, it goes up to six loyalty, makes a three, three that can defend itself. Right. Mm-hmm. And and six loyalty was so much. Now you look at Vivian; it makes it three three. That doesn't have haste to attack. Doesn't generate you additional mana, and it goes up to four loyalty. So it's like, okay, one of these cards is clearly better than the other. But the the thing that's most important is that if either live for a turn, you're probably going to win. So it behooves you to defend it at all costs. And once that Vivian was able to lay around for just an additional turn, the game really swung Ikawa's way, and that's where we're headed to game number three. Yeah, easy game there. You saw uh, Avignon at the end picked up the great henge almost to just rub it in his face. He had, he was nowhere near being able to cast it as Ikawa very wisely made sure that he had no board state whatsoever. Dude, with just the one card in hand, he ended up with uh, whatever, you know, 15, 16 mana worth of stuff and couldn't cast anything and had the ship to turn back over to, to Ikawa. And uh, as a result, he lost the game. So game number three incoming, a quick sideboard from our two players, and it looks like they're ready to go. How does this opener look on the bottom for Avignon? All right, so I've, I've been here before. I've seen openers like this. So it's keepable. It, it, it's, it's tough, right? So you want to keep this hand because mm-hmm. you have a great henge, and the great henge is an ace in the mirror. What's difficult about this is your way to the great henge is via the mammoth. Mammoth mm-hmm. is also your third land. Ah, okay. okay, so Mammoth is so Mammoth is no longer your third land because you drew one. That's nice. Happy with that. Okay. So now you're going to play the Mammoth on three, and you're going to hope to draw a fourth land so that you can play the Henge. I see, because you get the trigger, the power goes up, then your lands do it. Uh-oh, that was a gem raiser. So, All right, so now we're shifting. So now, oh, we're, saying, so okay. now we're saying Mammoth is our third land, and we're going to play Questing Beast on four and kind of play a different game. Okay. Now, if there was 
a land. Yeah, that's really close, right? Like, if that was a land, do you think that Avignon would have just cast the the mammoth? So if that gem raiser was a land, he would have just played the mammoth, and then you know the next turn play a land five five play henge. You know, right. you don't really have much to do with the henge because your 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 uh, your creatures all cost more than two mana. Um, the the big question is like, is it worth the risk to play the mammoth on three when you don't have land four, hoping you peel land four? And he would not have peeled land four. Right. So now what is it? Is it just slam the beast and get busy? Yeah, I mean, this is actually a tough call, right? Because you could play QB, and if you play Questing Beast and attack, Bone Crusher Giant's going to block, mm -hmm. right? Almost assuredly. Maybe I'm wrong about that. So you can just play Gem Razor as a 4-4 and just pass the turn back and try to find a better spot for Questing Beast, which I think is a reasonable decision. Okay, so Gem Razor hits the battlefield the hard way, right? Uh, you don't see this that often. And no, look, really. perhaps a little hint here as to things to come if you're in Ikawa's seat. As the giant gets in, no block here from the gem raiser. Avignon says, yeah, sure, take it. No problem. No big deal. Yeah, so this is interesting, right? Because, Aven uh, excuse me, Akawa has sideboard and Emberith Shieldbreaker, which you should when you're playing against a deck that has opposing great henges. At the very worst, it's a 2-1. Um, hmm. But also it could be a 2-1 that can trips when you have Edge One Keeper on the battlefield. So he's well set up against the great henge. Now, Avignon's kind of playing a game towards getting the great henge onto the battlefield. And that Great Henge is not going to be all that productive, which is a bummer for him. So I'm curious to see what the next couple of turns look like here for both players. It, it's it's turning out to be a little bit interesting here. By the way, the great crab debate in the chat is raging on. Now somebody just called somebody uncultured for not having tried oh, there a crab you go. game before. There it is. It's really just hit the wall. We'll let them continue that important discussion in the chat. You know, one other thing that comes to mind, Cedric, about not blocking with the gem razor and what it may signal to Ikawa is that a lot of the removal, right, the, the primal mites, and the ramp throughs and stuff does require a creature being on the battlefield. So, you know, if the green deck has to just continue to keep trading stuff off, you know, you can see a, a world where they're looking to leverage their, their, their fight spells, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. And, and so this turn, I really like what Avignon's done here, which is, well, I thought he was going to attack. I'm actually genuinely surprised he's not attacking, which means we just ran the no attacks with the no block, no attack. I'm a little surprised by that. Um, especially when you have five, five. That. Okay, yeah, I, well, I would actually I would actually describe that as uncultured of Avignon to not so attack I, or block. I'm slightly surprised by the no attack, no block. Um, but by <laughs> playing by playing Love Struck Beast, your plan here is to deploy the Great Henge the next turn and use that mana to play either Primal or Ram Through. And you have to get this thing off the battlefield now. This video. Okay, well, you know, that is a cultured play there from Avignon. If if we see a, a Great Henge next turn, then all is forgiven. Uh that is uh what I would consider to be perfect draw. So you play, you play Bonders Enclave, you play Henge, you can Primal and Ram through to kill both blockers and then kill Vivian with your Gem Razor. So holy smokes, this turn from Avignon! Wow, he's and he's got Ikawa tapped out too, right? So yeah, so you're you're clear for takeoff to get Vivian and the creatures off the battlefield and leave your opponent with basically nothing. And you have a great Henge. Yeah, and they have to answer it because if they wow. don't, the game is going to spiral out of control. Now we know there's an answer, but they have to answer it. Right. What a turn here. Look at this. So punch the giant. Primal might. The only downside is that the beast doesn't get to get in there either. Or yeah, as well. that's, the, that's the only frown. I'm not going to complain. <laughs> Just killing your opponent's entire board, including the window to kill Vivian right when you really needed to. Super, super brutal turn there from Avion's side. He's got to be thrilled with the way that went. And then, as you mentioned, he's basically put Ikawa in check. He says, look, you need to have an answer for the Great Engine. As you mentioned, he did. So Ember Shieldbreaker is going to take it down. But still, he's facing down four power with the potential for it to be nine uh, coming across next turn quite easily with depending on what comes off the top of the library or if you're sitting in Kawa seat, what is in hand for Avignon. And he, now he's got to try to play catch up. Yeah. And what's difficult here for Ikawa too, is to take a look at the contents of his hand, scorching Dragonfire, awful, great henges, uncastable. And well, if oh, 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 another great henge off the top of the library for Avignon. And he, the hits just keep coming for him. 
And I'm mm-hmm. curious. So this is this is maybe a minor critique. I know he thought about it for a minute. Of do I play the Great Henge or do I or do I play something else? Like he did have the opportunity to just say, I'm going to play Questing Beast and attack you for eight and put you to the test. We might still just see him play the Great Henge now. So you nothing. Is that a full? Z- Whoa! So he just wants to draw a card with Bonders Enclave. Ah, I don't love that. That's a little too conservative for my tastes. Dude, it's the Great Henge. What's happened? <laughs> I mean, you, either either you're playing the Henge or you're playing the Questing Beast. That's just it's just a little too conservative for, for you not how play I played the turn. Well, you if you play your Henge co- your Henge costs four, and then your one costs- playing Questing Beast. Okay. So like so, so you basically not play both, but yeah, still so, yeah. So basically, like if you play if you play Henge and then it gets blown up, you're annoyed, but it's not the end of the world because you're already pretty far ahead. So it's a decision of do I want to attack you for eight or do I want to play Henge with the chance of you shield breaking it again? Right, but instead but I, he just shows a draw a card. Yeah, but instead he just shows a draw a card, which I don't love because I I mean I don't really know the best way that Ikawa was going to get back into this game, but that just that, that play just feels too conservative to me when you could just be running downhill in two different ways that your opponent has to answer immediately. I got to give props to Avignon though. He actually found a way to make me upset for not choosing the thing that was draw a card. Like sure. <laughs> found it. Avignon found the line and I got to give him props for that. Wow. So interesting. He decided to play the serpent, not as he decided to play it as a two, two to max out. Cause he's going to get the counter. And then he drew another one. He, he has a hard time getting a one, one on the battlefield now for his uh, beast. Yeah, that's the thing. When you Awkward. have the great henge going, the only one, the only way to get a one-one on the battlefield, and you have henge on the battlefield, is you're drawing another copy of Love Struck Beast for Heart's Desire. Now, again, even though you and I are critiquing Avion's plays a little bit here, he is immensely ahead. He's only pushing further ahead now, and that is going to do it. Yeah, he was smashing that game, boy. That one turn that he had really did seem to signal the end from Ikawa's 